Thanks so much. Uh, I, um, I think all of that uh, nice introduction should tell you is that um, I wasn't here to hear any of the remarks yesterday, and yet I've been asked to give a little bit of a wrap up <laughs> with some perspectives. Um, and, and I will, I will um, come clean right from the beginning and uh, say that I have never led an ERC, nor have I ever been involved in an ERC. And I'm, I'm here because I would love to learn what is, what is the future of, of, the, of the ERC program and how can we make them as successful as, as, as possible going forward. The center programs at the National Science Foundation are incredibly important resources um, for a number of reasons. The STCs, the Science and Technology Centers, the MERSEX, the Chemical Innovation Centers, and the engineering research centers have allowed universities to um, explore new models of research. And I think that going forward now with this new generation of engineering research uh, centers, there's a lot of very exciting opportunity. The ERC program has always had a goal of enhancing US competitiveness by transferring intellectual value and technology that's developed in the centers into the commercial sphere and also to create economic value indirect, uh, indirectly through the training of a diverse group of students with skills to innovate. This is a direct quote from the recent uh, NASM report, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report on, on the ERCs. Um, the, the report goes on to state that the top level goal of future ERCs should be to solve uh, societal problems with engineering research um, and to equip students with the fundamental knowledge on how to deliver those uh, solutions to society. This recommendation I totally agree with that future ERCs uh, should address grand challenge problems and do more than uh, simply in, uh, create new models of research partnerships among industry, academia, and government, um, but to, to um, change its value proposition to have the kind of global society impact that I think we all as researchers dream of, of, of one day having with our research. Why do I think it's important to have the, that the ERCs focus on grand challenges? Well, grand challenges by, just by their, their nature necessitate a convergent research approach. Grand challenge problems cannot uh, be solved uh, by any one person or any one discipline. Uh, grand challenges inspire us on all levels. They give us goosebumps, or at least they should. Put a man on the moon or a person on the moon by the end of the, of the decade. That's exciting. That's inspiring. Um, they also provide a concrete mission statement for the center and a common sense of purpose. If you set out your research goals in the form of a grand challenge, then it's easy to get everyone on the same page and for everyone in the room to know why they're there and what they're all trying to do. And so in that sense, the grand challenges framework facilitate creating the value proposition. Like like we've heard about this morning. Um, grand challenges also have the benefit of being explained easily to laypersons, regardless of their educational background, regardless of politics, and will help us to build bridges um, and to explain to the public what it is that we do and why research, science, science and engineering, uh, uh, and, and math research is so, so important. The Hartford Engineering Alum is a perfect example of a grand challenge that is just self-evident. It's obvious why that would be a good thing if someone could engineer limbs. It requires no convincing whatsoever, and it also probably requires no convincing whatsoever that being able to do that requires a lot of science, a lot of engineering, and, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, a lot of medicine, a lot of hard work, um, and that it might be worth supporting. 
Um, as scientists and engineers, I think we need to pull our heads out of the sand and participate in explaining and motivating and selling our research. And we heard about this in the, the last talk. Um, you know, we, it's easy for us to find our research intrinsically exciting and important um, if we frame what we're doing in the context of a grand challenge. It makes that all the, the, the more easy. Outreach and engagement for a center that is focused on a grand challenge problem should be easy because the idea should sell itself. Outreach engagement is absolutely critical for um, continuing to get support from the public for science research, but also for the democratization of science. Um, and grand challenges are high risk, and high risk uh, goals foster creativity, inspiration, obviously risk taking, and, it, and they convey a sense of urgency. And so it makes it easy to prioritize that kind of research sometimes over the other research that you might, you might be doing. So one example of a grand challenge problem uh, for a center to focus on that they gave in this um, National Academies report is they proposed, as an example, an, an engineering research center to develop practical approaches to dealing with issues of sea level rise and extreme weather events for coastal cities. That seems like a great problem. It's the kind of problem that cannot be solved by any one person, any one, any one discipline, discipline. It's obviously important. Um, it would involve civil engineers, hydrology, meteorology, uh, data science, scientific computing, uh, uh, law, architecture, political science, social science, and, and I'm sure they left a few out when they gave this example in, in, in the report. Uh, what, what might be some other future ERC themes that could represent grand challenges? Um, if I think about the future and how, where a lot of the engineering research that we're doing um, is, is going, we hear a lot about the Internet of Things, everything connected to everything all the time. Uh, robotics, autonomous vehicles. Those three things, those are all huge and, and rapidly growing areas of research for many. Um, and all of them involve the idea of ubiquitous sensing. You can't have any of those things without sensors, 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 all kinds of sensors everywhere on all the time. So how many of you read the book or saw the movie The Circle? You know, where Google and, and, and Microsoft and, and YouTube and everything is all together in the one like big U-face thing and everything's connected to everything. Everybody has sensors on all the time. We are constantly sharing our most private information uh, and it creeps up on us in ways that every single step sounds like, yeah, sure, I want to do that. Yeah, I want to play Candy Crush. I don't care if you, if, you, if you see where I am while I'm playing it. And we give these little freedoms away, and then all of a sudden we have this situation. So this is something where another example of technology running uh, ahead, and we're all very excited about it, um, and there are enormous societal implications um, of this. So what about an ERC on, I don't know, this sounds kind of dry, but ensuring data security and privacy? That would be the, 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 the boring uh, example for that. Yes? Awesome. Okay, I'm going to cross that one off the Michigan list. Um, an earlier speaker mentioned that we're no longer in the industrial age, we're in the computer age. So I would call that that we're in the silicon age um, because it is materials and the availability of materials and our ability to harness those materials that define civilization all the way from uh, the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to, you know, to the Iron Age. Um, and so yesterday in one of my talks at Kalamazoo College, I, I asked the students, what materials do they think will define our civilization 
in 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years? What, what age will we be in then? And they gave lots of great examples. Um, regenerative materials, like uh, Cato talked about this morning, is a great example of a future material. But what all of the materials that they gave examples of had in common is that they were designed and purposefully engineered materials for a target application and sort of and made on demand in a personalized way. So one day when we all have 3D printers next to the microwave in our house, this idea of materials or matter on demand uh, will um, may become a reality. Um, and uh, so perhaps an ERC that deals with the, uh, not only how engineering, scientifically and engineering wise, how do we get there, but what, is that, what does that mean for the way that we use and, and manufacture and, uh, and um, uh, you know, buy materials today? What kinds of current processes in society will be disrupted from that? Some other ideas of grand challenges that to me seem obvious that they involve scientists and engineers and mathematicians and social scientists and political scientists and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. Um, an EFRC, an, sorry, an ERC to achieve carbon neutrality within a decade. An ERC on natural disaster prediction, prevention, and amelioration. Uh, how many of you have read the book The Bottom Billion? Okay, you should go out and buy that, buy that book. Um, what about an ERC uh, to raise the quality of life for the, for the bottom billion citizens of planet Earth? An ERC to span the digital divide, to democratize, democratize um, the internet. How do, you, how do you do that? That's, just, that's not just a networking problem. It's also, you need cheap materials to make, you know, cheap, uh, uh, devices, you need to think about what that means to have ubiquitous computing in areas where they have, uh, they don't have access to the entire world's information in their pocket all the time. Um, an ERC for reproducibility in science, this is a big deal, right? So that's something that's not just about changing our practices and the way that we do experiments and report results, but it also needs new kinds of technology that can help support us in achieving reproducibility in science. An ERC to ensure trusted voting processes in the 21st century. We know that even if we came up with the perfect technological solution tomorrow, that doesn't mean we solved the problem. This is the kind of convergent or problem that needs convergent research um, with, with participation from, uh, from you know, lawyers and political scientists and, and, and psychologists and social scientists and et cetera, et cetera. Um, an ERC to eradicate childhood obesity. Uh, Cato talked about polymer fibers before. One of the, the, the reason that so much fat and sugar is added to foods is not simply to make it taste good. It's mostly for the texture. Food needs to have a certain texture. I read somewhere once that there are 63 orthogonal dimensions for the Oreo cookie, meaning that there are 63 things they gotta get just right for an Oreo cookie to taste like you expect an Oreo cookie to taste. It's not just, you know, it's the crunch and then it's the creaminess and so it's the, all that, all those different textures together. It's, it's the taste, it's the mouth, it's all, and whatever, 60 other things that I don't remember. Um, so one of the approaches that engineers are taking now to replace fat in, in, um, in, uh, in foods and achieve the same texture and mouthfeel is to replace it with cellulose or you know, polymer fibers that, that, are, that are safe to eat. Um, so that is a problem that isn't just a matter of uh, you know, figuring out genetics or, uh, or changing 
the, the um, you know, or, or nutrition and things like this. This is, that's a problem for which there could be um, scientific and, and engineering solutions, but would require a convergent approach to not only figuring out how to attack it, but then implementing these changes in food companies. Um, what about an ERC for information integrity? That's what I would call it instead of um, an ERC for, uh, an ERC against fake news. So detection of fake news is a thing now. Who ever thought that, that would be a thing? But that's a thing, and it requires technology. Um, artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, right? To figure out what's fake news, what's not fake news, what's, how do you know if something is correct? How do you know if something is a fact? And even if you have technological advances to help figure that out, again, it needs a convergent approach. So regardless of the topic, Convergent engineering research is required for all of these example problems, and, and, and that requires or could also drive um, the invention of new models of, of collaboration, um, the invention of new curricula for, uh, for students that are not just taking material science courses and chemical engineering courses and a tech elective over here and a tech elective over there, but new curricula that helps them think in this new convergent um, research way. Um, producing a new breed, really, of scientists or engineer. Um, and potentially disciplinary transformations and even new models for how university units might work and might facilitate research um, in, um, in this convergent manner. So I, some, some questions come to mind um, to think about. Uh, for these future ERCs, um, which is in this new world of convergent science and engineering and convergent research, what should the modern university look like? And can these new ERCs down the road show the way for how, if we were building new, a new university today from scratch, what would it look like? Would it really look like the way that they look right now? Probably not. What should the modern university industry government research partnership look like? just like it, it does right now, where you kind of work out the IP and that's it, or something more substantive. What should we expect of the graduates that we produce in, from these new uh, ERCs? Should they somehow look different from or work differently or think differently than um, traditional graduates of, of STEM departments? And I think Margaret mentioned that earlier in, in, in her remarks. How do we measure um, the impact that being part of, an, of one of these new ERCs has on a student or an assistant professor. How, does it, how are they different for having gone through that experience? Um, but most importantly, I think, the question that we need to ask for these future ERCs is how will the world be different because this future ERC existed? And so if we go forward, if, you know, we award them next year and then we go forward, you know, 11 years from now and we look back and say, this is how the world is different. This is how we do X, Y, Z differently because this ERC existed. That is not something that we require of a materials research science engineering center, of a uh, science and technology center from NSF, an engineering, uh, an energy frontier research center from the Department of Energy. But I think that those are the kinds of questions that we want to ask of the future ERCs. Um, there are a lot of big opportunities to be had from these future ERCs. Um, what I see when I talk to our students today, undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, it doesn't matter, they all want to make a difference in the world. They are not taking jobs just for the highest salary. Um, they are not just taking jobs because the research is so cool. They're taking jobs where they feel that they can make a difference in, in the world. They want to be able to work with a sense of purpose and urgency. And they want to work in diverse teams. It comes very natural to this generation of, of, of young students. And they want to share the fruits of their labor. And this is something that is especially true for scientific software development. I run a group of um, 35 PhD students and postdocs. And we're a computational science group. We develop a lot of code. 
And the, the mentality today is completely different than it was in my group 10 years ago when people would write codes, but they never, and, and then they would do science with the simulation codes, and they would, they would publish the paper, and they'd say, I published a paper, that's awesome. Now I'll wait for citations to show up. It's completely different now. Now they all want to participate in the development of, of, of publicly disseminated open source code. The idea that they could develop some scientific simulation software and put it out there on the interwebs and have other people around the world use their code to do their own science is a huge reward to students today. Um, I think that the kind of future ERCs that we're talking about would have great appeal to the very best and brightest students and, and young faculty that we have. Um, a few more comments, a few more opportunities. The NASIM report on ERC states that research has shown that if programs emphasize engineering as a source of societal benefit rather than focusing more narrowly on technology per se, they have increased appeal to women and underrepresented minorities. So again, framing these ERCs in terms of societal impact and, um, and grand challenges um, might help to increase the proportion of women and underrepresented minority students um, that are going into STEM fields. Um, I think also AI is super hot right now. Everybody wants to do data science. Data, data, data. AI plus X. I think that you'd be hard pressed to find a grand challenge problem that is worth doing that would not benefit from artificial intelligence. Um, and, and so that is a real opportunity. Um, we, it used to be when Bill Gates was running around giving talks, begging students to please go into computer science because we don't have enough people to write code and write software. And now computer science departments have exploded overnight. A lot of uh, high school students going into undergraduate programs think I have to be a computer scientist if I want to do something with computers or if I want to do something with data science and artificial intelligence. But that's not true. They can go into any field of engineering and do data science and use computers and participate in the artificial intelligence revolution. And so I think that's another opportunity for these um, engineering research centers of, of the future. Um, I think that this new ERC model is well positioned to encourage student involvement also in things like entrepreneurship, industrial internships, exposure to problems and expertise in industry and the public sector, issues of ethics, of data reproducibility, science and technology policy, public policy, global citizenship, and the human condition. This is the idea that these centers would provide a different kind of education to today's engineering um, and, and other students. Um, also, I will say that um, it seems like we live in a country that's different than I thought it was, or that it was 10 years ago. Um, and we must together address the major issues that seem to divide us. I think that most of the issues that divide um, our country today would benefit from, or in many ways require, some sort of technological innovation in the context of convergent research to democratize the opportunities that are available to every US citizen. Um, but we all know that technological innovation through engineering research that occurs in a vacuum will not solve a single societal problem. Um, and it won't bridge this big divide that we have right now, um, or that we seem to have right now. Um, a few just final thoughts um, about practical considerations that I was thinking about as I was listening to this morning's speakers. Um, it's really important to build um, and sustain the right team that you pull together for the ERC. And that, that, you know, it's exciting to have a big idea and then pull together like the best people on the planet to tackle that idea. But it's, it's it's not necessarily so easy to just build your team that way. Um, there are considerations. Do you find the best people on the planet to go after this big uh, grand challenge problem 
even if you've never ever worked together before, how do you know that you'll be successful? If you bring in your longtime collaborators um, to work together because you have a demonstrated history of success, will you be able to think outside the box enough to solve these new problems in this, in this new way? And, and how do you balance that? That's something that I'm, I struggle with, of thinking of how do, how do you do that? Do you want the usual suspects or an unusual combination of people? Openness versus clubby, clubbiness. Sometimes when, when, when you have centers at universities, the people who are listed on the proposal, they get the center, woo, they're very happy. Everybody else is like, well, I'm not involved in that, in that center, so I don't, what, you know, how, I don't, how am I gonna get involved with that? Um, and I think that there need to be mechanisms for that. A lot of centers say, oh, we have seed grants. You could apply for a seed grant. Okay, there needs to be more than, than that um, in these new EFRs, in ERCs. Um, how do you refresh the ideas and the membership of the, of the center? This morning's speaker discussed the importance of staying on mission and, and, and knowing which advances, which research successes that are happening in the center, while they may be very exciting and interesting and important, may not contribute to the mission. And so, therefore, they should be somehow spun off while other ones that are contributing to, to the mission should be, should be nurtured. That's not so easy to do. Um, scientists and engineers, faculty, I guess, don't, don't think that way um, about having to have all this, this turnover all the time. Um, and so I think, but I think if we're gonna go after grand challenge problems, that's exactly how we have to, how we have to think. Um, getting your university slot is a thing. Right, so I don't know how this call is going to be. I'm assuming, right, that there'll be like every university can submit X number of proposals or something, right? This is a thing that NSF does now. And so there's considerations within your university of I have to get that slot first, right? So how do I, how do, what's, what's the right strategy for putting together a team that is the best team to solve this grand challenge problem that will re review really well and also convince my university that they should select it over another one that might involve more people from my university. That's a real thing. It doesn't happen in Michigan, but I could imagine it happens places. Um, Cato talked about rock stars. Um, and how he has these awesome rock stars involved. Okay, well, rock stars are busy. Um, and if you pull together, you know, the Cato Lorenzens and the Bob Langers of the world to solve these grand challenge problems, which would be awesome because they're brilliant, um, how do you ensure their substantive, real, and sustained engagement intellectually over time? Um, and so, uh, I like this idea of shared leadership because sometimes the, 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 the best people to lead something are also the busiest people, but the people with, and, and they're the people with the vision, but you might want to bring a number of PIs together to have this shared, shared leadership, but I don't think that NSF allows um, co-directors. I could be wrong. I might be wrong. Dawn can tell me what, if I'm wrong when she gives her remarks in a minute. Um, but I think that's something, a practical consideration to, to think about. And just thinking about how to integrate researchers at all levels. Um, changing the research culture is another practical consideration that will have to be thought about in these new ER, ERCs. Um, if we're going after these grand challenge problems, everyone has to check their egos at the door. They have to embrace ignorance. So I, um, even though I'm in chemical engineering, material science, and other departments, I sit in a convergent research institute um, that was started about eight, nine years ago called the Biointerfaces Institute. We have 25 core faculty from chemical engineering, material science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, pharmacy, dentistry, various departments in the medical school, and others. And the idea is to bring all these people together who work on very different things and know very different I, uh, topics and very different skills together around problems that's at the interface of bio and anything else in science and engineering. And I sit in these 
uh, meetings with uh, some of our cancer researchers trying to find how I can, how, if anything that I know or can do could be helpful to some problem of importance like, uh, uh, like that, like cancer detection or prevention. And, uh, you know, a few minutes into it, I have to stop them and say, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're saying. Not only that, I only understand like 17 of the words that you just spoke because there's a lingo. We all, every discipline has their jargon and has their lingo. And everybody needs to come together and say, I, have, I, do, not, I do not know what those words mean. Please stop and talk to me like I'm a 10-year-old for a minute so I can understand what, what you're talking about. Um, we have to bridge the language barriers, overcoming curricular barriers, rewarding collaboration, making sure that you align the tenure and promotion uh, criteria with collaboration, especially for, say, assistant professors, is super important. Um, but maybe most important is the idea of rewarding failure, starting at the earliest possible career stage. We're proposing high-risk research um, that we're going to do in ways that are different than we ever did before. And so if you're not failing a lot, you're not doing it right. You're not taking high enough risk. And you know, some students are afraid to fail. They think that's a bad thing because they, you know, they come to college and they were the top in their high school and they have A, 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 A and everything. They never failed anything. They never failed a quiz. They never failed a test, nothing. And they're going to do this exciting, important research and they will go down dead ends and, and things won't work. And it's so important to, to reward that. And I'm sure we all do that in our research groups. But thinking about how to do that on a institutional level, and especially for assistant professors who are so stressed about the idea of you know, getting tenure and making sure that everything works so they don't lose time because that could affect, you know, the earlier we start rewarding failure and figuring out how in the promotion and tenure process we reward, not all kinds of failure, noble failures, right? <laughs> Those are the failures you want to you want to reward, um, and so I think teaching the idea of research portfolio risk diversification as a part of mentoring um, is something that uh, that is is important to think about as we um, develop these new models of convergent research and ask people to go outside of their comfort zones and do things in, in new and different ways. So thank you for listening to me while eating so quietly. That was very impressive. Um, and I'm happy to talk more if there's time. Thanks. I'm sure that Sharon would be entertaining questions if you'd like. Questions? So I'm hearing a lot of barriers, and I think a lot of the barriers have to do with the uh, long-standing business model of academia, where we think in you know, the quantum of a graduate student and a project, and, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, I think, inefficiencies in that. And I think part of what we're learning um, throughout today and yesterday with convergence research is that we need to be flexible, we need to be nimble, and we need to move around. I think in industry, uh, people work based on the value that they bring to a particular project. Mm -hmm. In academia, we build these teams, and I think we heard that once a team is built, it doesn't, doesn't get broken up. And, and I think we also heard an earlier example where you know, a center is formed and pretty much all the resources are locked up and very few of the resources are available to do, um, you know, little seed projects. And so I'm thinking, or I guess I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, um, can there be a way that we can break past these legacy barriers and, and think towards the future of how we can be um, more nimble as an academic community? I, I think those, that's a great question and those are, those are excellent points. I, I, um, I couldn't agree more that, I think the issue that there, there are some things that won't change. It'll, on average, always take five years to get a PhD, <laughs> right? And, um, and so that will, that will and, and they will always cost an amount that you need to raise. As far, I mean, I don't, right, and unless there's an entirely new model of university um, and government funding. 
Um, and so, uh, I mean, that's, that's somehow where these partnerships can come from if industry contributes to paying for some of the graduate students, say, and then they have a pipeline to a job afterwards, you know, something like that. Um, that could lift some of these restrictions and free up some of the federal funds that are, that are coming to the, to the institution. Um, but but th there's always this quantum, right? And, and, it, and, and if, even to participate in something, if you don't, if you're not invested at least at the level of a student, then you can only do so much, right? And you want, you want to be very involved, but that, that, costs, that costs money. So I think that these types of centers and any kinds of these big centers need to be nucleating new funds, new mechanisms. It shouldn't be an, an end in itself. We have the funds, we have the center, there's so much money we have to spend every year, let's go. They should be a vehicle for getting, being able to raise additional funds, especially as you think about long-term sustainability of these centers when they start to sundown. Um, and I, so I think that, you know, figuring out how to, how to go after, you know, that's another motivation, in fact, for going after grand challenge problems because those problems donors love, right? And so maybe that's something that can facilitate monies from, from that side. Yeah, one last question. Hi, um, Joe Lab, Texas A&M University. So this morning when I was looking at, listening to Dr. Lorenzen, I noticed that <clears throat> Some of the accomplishments he uses as examples came from pairwise interactions, mm -hmm. and that really resonated with me because also I think about some of the sort of things that we've published over years that I've, I've liked, and they've also come from these pairwise interactions. So I just wanted to hear your take on, from your own personal experiences with research, what you think about that, and then going to larger groups or having smaller groups within larger groups, mm -hmm, or, or mm -hmm. how, you know, how does that? Basically, how do you feel about that in terms of this uh, interdisciplinary research? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think that that's not uncommon, what, what he was showing. I, if I think about um, some of my biggest research accomplishments or think in terms of my high, most highly cited papers, they're almost always binary. I'm involved in a number of big centers right now um, with a bunch of rock stars and all the papers that we tend to write are binary and ternary, even though there's like 14 of us. And I think that that's just the natural way it, things work, that it's kind of a, band, a bandwidth thing. Even when I've run big programs, um, like Department of Defense funded programs with say five PIs for five years, it was rare to have a paper with all five. You would have papers with you know these two and then these two and then these two and then these three, um, but it was it was it, it wasn't you know unless you were writing like a review or a perspective paper, but the, the science seemed to be done more on that on that scale, um, and I don't you know I don't I don't know how to get I don't know if that's just a um, a, a, um, a human tendency or it's reflective of the, of the bandwidth that we have, or how much in, in one scientific paper you can bridge together when you have people with all these different skill sets. Oftentimes you're working on this part and then you work on that part. So join me in thanking Dr. Glossner for an excellent presentation. Okay, well now it is my most distinct pleasure to introduce our um, last speaker for some closing remarks. We're very lucky that Dr. D uh, Dawn Tilbury has agreed to come. She is, as you probably know, AD of Engineering, so as director of a whole directorate, I know her schedule is extremely busy, so we greatly appreciate her taking the time. She, I believe, came to NSF about a year ago. She's a professor at the University of Michigan in mechanical and electrical engineering. She has been very much a leader in moving interdisciplinary teams forward. Her research focuses on control systems, uh, particularly advanced robotics research. She's extremely highly published. She holds patents, and um, she um, 
thus far has been a, a tremendous leader at NSF. So thank you very much. Um, it's great to see you all here today, see some old friends and uh, maybe some new faces. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed this uh, two-day workshop that we've had. Um, it looked like a great agenda. As you mentioned, my schedule is a little crazy, so there's no way I could have attended it, but I'm glad I got to, to see the tail end of the, of the metrics talk and then, uh, and then Sharon's talk. And so I have only a few uh, remarks to make here, and then I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, before you go back to your institutions and keep going on your planning grants. <clears throat> so some of this you may have heard before over the last couple of days, but I think it's good to think about it when we refresh at the end of the workshop. The ERC program was created in 1984, so more than 30 years ago, to bring industry, university, and government together to produce advances in engineering, innovative technologies and effective solutions that translate into valuable industry-ready products and services. Many current technologies and innovations that we appreciate today evolved from NSF ERCs. These innovations have helped build a stronger economy, developed a more qualified workforce, and bridged the gap between fundamental research and real-world employment. The goal of the ERC program at its beginning was very simple to revolutionize U.S. engineering education and research. And the first ERC in 1980, well, it was announced in 84, I think the first one was funded in 86, had a budget of $10 million for 10 years. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but that was a lot of money at the time, and they attracted 142 proposals from more than 100 institutions, and they awarded six centers in that first round. Now, as I'm sure you've talked a lot about these last couple days, ERCs work on convergent research. And NSF identifies convergence as having two primary characteristics that I'm sure you heard. The first is deep integration among disciplines. When experts from different disciplines come together to pursue common research challenges, the knowledge, theories, methods, data, and research communities, and languages become increasingly intermingled and integrated, and new frameworks and paradigms can emerge from this collaboration. The second is that they're driven by a specific and compelling challenge. So it's not just, hmm, let me call up my friend in biology and my friend in geoscience and my friend in math and we'll get together and write an ERC proposal or come up with a convergent research approach. It has to be start from the challenge that you're addressing, the grand challenge or the specific problem, and figure out who you need to add to your team to get that. So I'm sure if you call up your friends from across campus, you'd come up with some really cool ideas, but it may not be convergent. <clears throat> so current national challenges that we face, you know, clean water, uh, sustainable energy, personalized medicine require these types of convergent research approaches. And so therefore we need to make changes in the way that we do research and educate students so they're prepared to conduct this research. In my experience, students are inspired to work on these kinds of challenging problems that are interdisciplinary, but they struggle because they don't always have the tools that they need to address this type of interdisciplinary research and talking across disciplines. Even faculty have challenges. A while ago, I was working with a colleague in psychology, and we were putting together a study on emotional control. So I work in control, she works in emotions, like, oh, we can do this, right? And uh, we were sitting in, the white, in a conference room at the whiteboard, and I'm drawing this plot of a variable X that's changing over time, and she looks at me shocked and says, variables don't change over time. And then I said, of course they do, that's why we call them variable. <laughs> And so in her mind, in this study we were designing, the variables were whether the children were boys or girls. And were they from this preschool or that preschool? And that wasn't gonna change over the course of the study. And to me, the variable was, well, we're strapping accelerometers to these kids and we're gonna measure how much they move and that's a variable. It's gonna change over time, over the hour long that we have them for. So and when we finally understood that she thought acceleration was a metric and not a variable, um, we got closer to doing convergence, right? 
understanding each other's languages. Any of you who've tried to learn to speak another language understand it's not rocket science, but it takes time and discipline and effort to learn to speak that other language. But it is a, a great <clears throat> outcome when you can finally communicate across cultures, whether that culture is from engineering to psychology or from the US to Spain or whatever. So I think ERCs have always been an example of convergent research. I think we're broadening the types of fields we want to bring into that convergence, but we've always been working across disciplines because they've been addressing specific challenges. So when I was uh, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, I was one of those who was lucky enough to participate in an ERC. Um, I joined the University of Michigan in 1995, and in 1996, the university was awarded uh, an ERC on reconfigurable machining systems. Gallup, also here, was deputy director, I think, and Yoram was the director. And they came to me and said, why don't you write a proposal to this ERC? And machining systems? I'm not sure what a machine tool is. Um, I did my PhD in robotics and control. I know a lot about control. Um, but I thought this is an opportunity to take on a new challenge. And through working with the center, I was able to talk with the people in industry and understand what the challenges they were facing today on the plant floor. Now, university students are not good at solving problems on the plant floor today. But by having those conversations, I was able to understand the bigger picture of what the challenges were, bring them back to the university, and help a graduate student outline a research problem that he could <clears throat> or she could uh, write a paper on and publish towards a PhD degree. So I think it was a great collaboration with uh, NSF funding for the basic research and industry collaboration to inspire the problems um, <clears throat> that the students would work on. One of the areas that I got into through the ERC was network-based control. At the time, in any manufacturing plant, there were miles of wires connecting every sensor and every motor back to some control system where it was uh, collected and the decisions made and sent out again. There were also networks coming out, industrial networks to carry all of that data and replace those miles and miles of wire, make them more reliable, save a lot of cost, maintenance, debugging, this was going to revolutionize manufacturing. However, when I was talking to one of our industry partners, he told me they had set up this new manufacturing line, put all networked sensors on it, and it was too slow. They were supposed to make one part every 20 seconds, and they were at least 10 or 15 percent behind. So networks are really fast. How can you add two seconds to every part? But somehow, it wasn't set up correctly. They didn't quite understand how to use this technology. And so a few milliseconds of delay added up over hundreds and thousands of sensors really makes an impact. And so this is not something I would have thought about studying, but by hearing what the challenges they were facing, we came back to the university and started understanding how networks work in the mechanical engineering department, not creating new network protocols, but really understanding how the networks work in con conjunction with mechanical systems and wrote a bunch of papers on network-based control, which are still some of my highest cited papers. Very fun to work on you know, different kinds of things, bringing them together. So the planning grants that you guys have all received were one of the direct recommendations from that report that Sharon mentioned by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I don't know if any, how many of you have read that report. It's a great report. There's a lot of great recommendations in there, many of which conflict with each other. So it's not really a blueprint for a solicitation. But they're great ideas. <clears throat> but the goal of the planning grants is to give all of the teams that you represent the tools and techniques to help you be successful in convergent approaches to research. As I mentioned, it takes significant time to build a team, to learn to speak each other's languages, learn to work together, and make that <clears throat> team headed towards solving these important problems with societal significance. So the planning grants are intended as a capacity building activity across all four foundational components of an ERC. The research, which I'm sure is all foremost in your mind, what's the exciting research problem that we're going to attack? But don't forget about workforce development. 
That's one of the key components of an ERC, is developing the future workforce in these new areas. Also, diversity and inclusion. I, I hope you heard already that the ERCs, on average, are much more diverse than the average engineering school population. They have more women, they have more underrepresented minorities, and they have more, they create these cultures of inclusion, which helps to bring the teams together and helps the research move forwards. And finally, innovation. Coming up with ideas that have potential to translate into industry um, products, services, new, um, new te technologies. So we hope that these capacity building activities that you're participating in this year <clears throat> are not just oriented towards an ERC, but they could strengthen any center scale engineering research in a broad sense. I'll give you the bad news. We don't expect to be able to award all of you an ERC grant, unfortunately. Um, the report from the National Academies did recommend that we increase the budget for the ERCs and increase the number of the ERCs, um, which are both great ideas. But in the current budget environment, we absolutely cannot do both. Um, however, we hope that what you've learned through this process through this workshop and the plan year of the planning grant will give you the tools that you need to be successful in other large uh, engineering research projects that may be submitted to donors, to industry, to other government agencies. So we think of this as a capacity building for the entire engineering community. You might be poised for an EFRI award. I hope you also heard that the EFRI program is accepting suggestions for new research topics that will be funded started in FY20, and you have to get your thing in by the end of October. So you might want to think about that. <clears throat> and we, NSF is also uh, in, inviting new ideas for NSF, big ideas, through the NSF 2026, and I think that one's also open till the end of October. So lots of ways for you to tell us, NSF, what we should be thinking about for future research directions. So more than 34 years now, the ERC program has brought universities and industries together to produce engineering advances that improve, have improved healthcare, energy, electronics, information technology, and manufacturing capabilities <clears throat> of our country. The center's new discovery and solutions have resulted in many inventions, new companies, and have contributed to a growing economy. NSF invest, estimates that over that 30-some years of the ERC, <clears throat> that the economic value of the output of the ERCs is in the tens of billions of dollars. So this is an estimate, but it's a huge estimate. And <clears throat> it shows the power of what we've been doing through these center-based approaches. It doesn't include the benefits of those products that are not economic. What about improved health, improved safety? Um, improved industrial productivity and environmental protection. Those are things that are hard to quantify with the dollar value at the bottom, which I thought was great why he had that metrics talk right before I only saw the end. But there are many different ways you can quantify the benefit of your research, and I hope you look at what is the right way to do that for your research. So we hope that the ERC programs will continue to produce many of our future scientists and engineers who will impact at nearly every aspect of our future lives. ERCs have a track record, as I mentioned, of diversity and inclusion, and produce graduate students who are pioneers and leaders in their fields. Building these types of innovators and trailblazers is paramount to NSF's ERC program and the building blocks of a growing economy and a strong factor in ensuring our global competitiveness. ERCs have had a wonderful record of success. However, we didn't want to rest on our laurels and keep doing the same thing again for another 30 years, which is why we asked the National Academies to write that report and think about, ERC is a great program. How can it be better? So we're looking forward to see the proposals for the first generation four ERCs and hope that they continue to advance engineering research, education, and innovation for decades to come. In another 30 years, we might have to have another report written, or maybe we'll do it the sooner than 30 years. We'll see. Hopefully, I won't be here by then. <clears throat> so I hope that you will all enjoy your journey 
along your planning grants and bring back to your universities some of the things you've learned here, also to your other research communities, professional societies, and colleagues, so you can be amb ambassadors for this convergent research approach addressing societal challenges. So thank you very much. I know I have plenty of time for questions, so I hope you have a lot of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, hosting us uh, at this workshop. Um, my question has to do with the types of grand challenges. So we hear in particular uh, energy and water and climate change, these ones come up. And in the context of the stakeholder, um, who benefits from that? If we think of Congress as the stakeholder, I wonder if there is a, a view that you know serving the bottom billion is in the U.S. interest and something that NSF dollars should be going towards. I'm sorry, I guess I didn't understand the question that you thought was not the right. Uh, meaning that how, how, how is the perception of spending NSF dollars on a grand challenge that does not necessarily, in a narrow sense, benefit the U.S.? <clears throat> I think it should benefit, so I think the grand challenges should benefit, doesn't necessarily have to be the U.S. economy, but people in the U.S. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it can so, be. But the bottom billion are generally not people in the U.S. I don't believe she was here when that comment was made. Oh, the that bottom. was one specific example. And then earlier, Nick mentioned that ultimately for NSF Congresses, and I assume you're making a reference to potentially the disconnect between some administrative views. So I think there. So I. I, I I guess I don't have enough context maybe to answer your question directly, but I will say, yes, Congress is the ultimate stakeholder, but we have, NSF has had a strong relationship with Congress over many years, and they trust our merit review process, okay? So we have a very well-defined merit review process that's seen across the world as the gold standard for determining what are the best projects to be funded. And so I think that's the lens that's going to, um, to look at the, the different topics. I, I don't think we want to uh, discount anything. Uh, one of the ERCs we awarded in the last round was about delivering health care to underserved populations. Now, maybe they're not the bottom billion, but they were definitely um, looking at different socioeconomic classes okay, and just how. to maybe to be more specific if it has global impact which might be you know energy in the developing world or food in the developing world or water in the developing world given the the review process that NSF has already would those be viewed as valuable grand challenge problems I think that it to my opinion yes I mean I think that we all live on the same planet Right, And if the population is going to keep growing as it's projected to do, we're going to need to solve these grand challenge problems in order to have a sustainable future, even here in the US. How's that? Hey, Dan. Um, thanks for coming here and, uh, and, and give us a summary. So traditionally for ERC has lots of corporate uh, you know, requirements. You have to collaborate with companies and also companies be part of the membership of the ERC and help the center. So my question is, for this new generation, when we look at, for example, uh, some of the translational um, changes, let's take, for example, uh, the uh, Apple as an example, the iPhone. So when iPhone first started, maybe there's not too much job associated with the apps and the others. So companies may not jump on it right away. So when we look at some of those kind of uh, topics, um, companies, you know, they are not existing company base for the topic of the ERC, but nevertheless, it could be, you know, help out, for example, a lot of people in the future. So how, the question is whether um, corporate industrial collaborations, particularly 
uh, memberships are still very heavily evaluated for the ERC. And second question is, if there's a certain topic that doesn't fill into that mode, how would those topics be evaluated? So I think the specific answer to that question will be in the solicitation, which will hopefully be out shortly. Um, but I think one of the strengths of the ERC program over the years has been this collaboration with industry. Um, partly through you know, joint funding of projects where industry contributes to the ERC, but also like I mentioned kind of in my example, as inspiring the university researchers to understand what are the challenges that industry is currently facing that they can't overcome with existing tools. So I think that is still a strong and important component of an engineering research center is have some kind of interaction with the industry, whatever that might be. Maybe it's a, a very nascent industry and there's only really small companies. Maybe it's an, a mature industry and there's big giant companies. Um, but I, I don't think, so I don't think there's one model for industry partnership and even in the current ERCs, there's not one model for industry partnership. It really depends on the space that you're working in. But I think it is, in my opinion, is still valuable to have these industry collaborations in an engineering research center. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Shashi Shekhar from University of Minnesota. Uh, thank you for sharing some of the grand challenges like personalized health or, or the sustainable energy. But these grand I think those were all from the uh, NAE report on the engineering grand challenges from what, 10, 12 years ago? Yes. yes. So yeah, they're great grand. I think yeah. they're still all grand challenges, but probably each one of them is too big for yeah. Yeah. And there one are, center. And there are many more in United Nations. Absolutely. But these problems interest multiple agencies. Absolutely. Right? Personalized health interest, NIH, and sustainable energy, I will guess, interest Department of Energy. So where is the line between NSF and mission-centric agencies? So NSF funds basic research in all areas of science and engineering. So uh, whereas Department of Energy or um, NIH have very mission-driven goals. So, there is some overlap. There are some projects that could be funded from multiple agencies. You have to choose which is the right one, you think, for, for your project. But, uh, but I think any of those engineering grant challenges could fit within the portfolio of National Science Foundation at the basic research level, fundamental research. Hi, Don. Keith Roper, University of Arkansas. First, thank you for being here, and thank you for supporting the engineering community as the assistant director at NSF. I'm curious what other evolutions you see taking place in the engineering director at NSF in response to this unfolding of convergence? I think, um, so in the overall engineering uh, directorate, I think we're trying to encourage engineering researchers to work more collaboratively, um, maybe not always to the end of of pure convergence, but really collaborating with people from different disciplines. You may have seen, um, I think EFRI, the EFRI uh, program has a lot of very interdisciplinary uh, topics where engineers are taking the lead. Um, and CMMI came out with a program last year they called Leap High, which was leading engineering for America's prosperity, health, and infrastructure. And so there are larger grants with multiple PIs targeting specific societal challenges. And so I think we're trying to do more of that. You also have, prob I hope, seen the NSF's 10 big ideas, which are all multidisciplinary challenge ideas, and engineering participates in all of the big ideas, um, working together with our colleagues in you know, physics and biology and social science, et cetera, to put out solicitations to invite the community to work on these larger challenge type problems. So I think, I think the idea from the report, the idea of con doing convergent research in, in engineering is, is definitely coming through in many areas of not just the engineering directorate, but across all NSF. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, Ozna Margon from Northeastern University. So uh, we're all talking about convergence and transdisciplinary research and collaboration, but given that the center is coming out of the engineering directorate, is there a limit where you would think uh, that we have overdone it? Let's say like 50% engineers and 50% you know, social scientists, 
lawyers. What's your take on that? It, it is an engineering research center, so I think engineering should have a leadership role. I mean, is that 50%? I don't know. But it shouldn't have a minor role. It should have a leadership role. How's that? <laughs> so. Additional questions? Well, then join me in thanking Dr. Tilbury. We really appreciate him.